So I get asked so often, how do I invest in real estate? And I get asked that question from people that are in other businesses with lots of money that are trying to figure out, should I park some money there? But I also get it from brand new agents and people that are just coming in the space, like how do I get started? So, so Eric, what are all the different ways, Kirk, what are all the different ways somebody could invest? It's just rapid fire. What are all the different ways I can get involved in real estate investing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we were just talking about, you know, buy a single family home, uh, you know, refinance that, take some money out, go buy a duplex. You know, you can invest in a, a syndication, which means you're part of a larger group uh, of buyers, you know, mm -hmm. so some buyer power. Um, small Kirk, you, you could do a small partnership. I mean, yeah. I do a lot of that. You could do other people's money. I mean, a lot of times we just go to somebody and say, hey, I got this great property I found, but I don't have any money. And that's what I did when I was 20 years old. And I would go to Uncle Tom and say, hey, I'll give you a, a return on your money, but I want to buy this property. And, and you could also argue, if I don't want to manage it, I can syndicate. I can technically, I could buy publicly traded assets like REITs mm -hmm. and I'm involved in some form of real estate. So there's hard to argue. There's, there's a lot of different, I can buy fix and flip, yeah. right? I can buy fix and hold, yeah. right? I could- You can buy entitlements. I could, I could find- a property entitlement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I could find a piece of land and I could develop. I could, I could literally take my potentially five or 6% commission and go find an off market property <laughs> and then take my commission and roll it into the deal. I think we talked yeah. about that a couple of years ago at the summit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find some partners and they bring in some and you're, you know, you're into it for hardly anything because you roll your portion is the 6% commission. Yeah, yeah. A lot of different ways. So, all right. We're in this conversation, but the person watching right now is like, so who are these guys? So uh, I'm going to start with the young guy first. So Kirk, <laughs> yeah. Kirk um, how long in real estate? Where are you from? How many properties have you acquired or transacted with over the course of your life? Um, I'm My name's Kirk Kessel. I'm from Melbourne, Florida. I've been in real estate since I was 18. So that would put me at 41 years. Um, bought my first piece of property when I was 15. I had to put up my dad's name. Um, bought a townhouse, got a great story on that, but we'll save it for another day. And um, I collected the rents. I used to go on moped and collect the rents. So, I mean, it started out, you know, just as one one little townhouse. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I was 25, I had over a million dollars worth of property. Yes. Um, but I leveraged myself. So there's there's some stories behind that too. And, yep. you know, Eric, we can all talk about those. But literally, I've owned everything from shopping centers. Um, I built shopping centers for myself. I built a lot of mini warehouse. I built condominiums. Um, high rises. High rises. Lots of subdivisions. I still have sub subdivisions going right now. And my favorite thing right now, just because I'm, I'm I'm lazy, is entitling something. So I take a piece of property, get the entitlements for you know 60, 70, 80, whatever it is, houses, and then I go sell to someone like Tom that wants to put houses on it or a, a big home company. So my job for the listener before I go to Eric, the old guy, is for you to listen through the lens of if I could sit down with a couple of people that between collectively, we're talking, you know, a thousand plus transactions and deals. If you could just get one or two insights to make you a better investor, a more intelligent investor, then this was worth all of the time that you put into this podcast. Um, Eric, give him that interesting to hear his story at 15. So tell yeah. him who you are, where you're from and give him your backstory on deals and transactions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, first of all, I always joke that I'm actually like 55. I just get good sleep and eat plant-based. And so I look like I'm 33, but yes. Um, okay. Yeah. No. So 15 years ago, uh, I bought a single family house, uh, on the university campus. I saved up 20% and, uh, put about 20, thousand dollars down uh so that turned into another one which turned into a duplex and which, how old were you uh i was uh i was 20 so i was i was 19 just turning 20 mm -hmm. so yeah i think i was actually 19 still when we closed uh i closed on that first one had my parents i say we because i had my parents co-sign the loan uh because the yeah. bank wasn't quite ready to, <laughs> to lend, kid lend, college. lend to a, yeah, yes. yeah, a kid that just made a bunch of money painting houses. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I uh, got a real estate license about 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's where I took the investing. I'm like, if I get a license, maybe I can watch the market a little more closely and maybe I can have an edge uh, and, and take this to the next scale. Um, what ended up happening is that's uh, exactly what happened, but I, I helped a lot more clients along the way. I got a lot sharper, uh, and then it just scaled up from there. It was it was probably the first maybe five or six years. It was buy one property a year, pretty slow growth. Mm -hmm. And then uh, probably about six years ago, five, six years ago, started buying apartments and realizing the scale and the impact, what you can yeah. do uh, if you invest in appreciation, not just some of the cash flow investing I was doing with the single family house, the yeah. houses. 
That's where things took off. So today, you know, you and I are partners with Covest. <coughs> you have lots of other partnerships. About how many units, doors uh, do you own now? Uh, so in all the partnerships. Yeah, yeah. So about twelve hundred. Um, oh, and there was there was someone that that's asked. A big that's a big number. Yeah, there's someone asked me a question uh, a couple of weeks ago. They're like, Eric, how many properties do you own by yourself? And I, I thought about it. I'm like, well, that's actually an easy question. I own my house, I own my cabin, and I own my office building. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, and everything is in some sort of partnership where I, I bring people in. Uh, and early on, I used to own everything myself. It was all about like, you know, kind of my own ego of build my own empire by myself. And yeah. one of the things that I want to impress upon people is you don't have to be the superhero. You don't have to do everything. You can yep. find some amazing partners to bring in that complement the strengths and weaknesses that you have to grow a lot faster. In, Which is really what you want. Yeah. Right? You want one the plus partners, one yeah. is, is yeah. four or five in this Yeah, game. If they're the same as you, you don't want to bring that partner into the, into the group. You want to bring somebody else to bring something else to the table. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's, let's just unpack this for a moment. So right now, the person listening has a database of past clients. Mm -hmm. They've got a sphere of influence. They know people. They're active in the business. They're seeing opportunities. And one of the things I hear all the time is, I see the deals. I don't have the money. <laughs> right? So, so let's just talk partnership selection, finding the money, do's and don'ts. What have you guys learned? We're going to make this, you know, uh, it's a conversation, but I want it to be very educational. Yeah. I really want this person to understand that they can do it. So how do I find partners? How do I find partners with money? If I'm the deal flow, which was uh -huh. the early days of his career. Yeah. And, and what us. I did in my early days, I either used um, owner financing, which I used a lot of it. It was back in 1981, 82, 83. So the rates were up at 18%. That was, you know, when we had, uh, yeah. Carter in. Yep. And so we had. Were you uh, looking at me and saying Yeah. Carter? You probably weren't even born back then. I know. I know. Stop. I was alive. I was, I so, was 11. So back, yeah. So back in um, that 82 vintage, you we had some bond mortgages that we could assume. So we typically would try to assume those mortgages. A lot of the market had gone up, um, not a lot, but the rates had gone up a lot. So people were like, just take over my mortgage. Yeah. So I ended up with 26 houses by the time I was 25 years old, but they were all leveraged. And then, and I can, if you remember this, they changed the tax reform act in 1986 and I held on with my fingernails. So that was my first, you know, yeah. hold on. So yep. the advantage of having partners is if you have somebody with some money that goes in there, you're not leveraged like I was. So I would, I would not advise doing it like I did it. Yeah. Um, just because the leverage, unless you got a big stomach and I was young and dumb and I didn't know any better, but it, at my age now, I don't want to do that. And so the way that Eric's doing it now and the way you're doing it, mm -hmm. I think it's a great way if you, if you don't have the stomach to do that type of stuff. So how do we how do we go from having a database of relationships to finding two, three, four partners? Yeah. What have you guys found that works? <clears throat> so if you control the deal flow, and, and sometimes we say deal flow, and it really, it's just knowing what a deal looks like and yeah. being I able to That's communicate that, we're unpack. right? Yeah. Just being able to say like, hey, this is on the MLS and this is a deal and this is why this is a deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That to me is controlling the deal flow in a way. If you do that and you brand yourself as someone who understands uh, how these properties work and, and how deals work, uh, you, there's an abundance of partners out there. And one I thing that agree. we talked about early on is, you know, if you're an agent and you have a license and you can earn a commission uh, and you can maybe find a property that, that might be off market, maybe on market, but, uh, and you can add your commission Rolling towards in. your down payment, and let's say you're dividing this up between a few partners, you got three of you and you're all putting six and a half percent in to get to that 20%, mm -hmm. um, you know, your portion is covered by your commission. So uh, almost entirely. So, but you could also, to, to his point, you could also negotiate it because he's bringing the deal. So I bring the deal. Let's say Eric brings the deal to me and says, yep. hey, I'm going to throw my commission in, but I want 20% of the deal. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get paid a 10% management fee. I'm going to manage this property. So all of a sudden, now we've got a 20% partner, and then the other 80% are going to be the other two guys with the with the cash, and you could pay cash for the property. Right. You could leverage a property. But let's say Eric couldn't get the financing. He's still get, going to get 20% of the deal. You and I are going to go to get the loan. So I'm going to go yeah. back to the question, which was, how do I find partners? And the answer I'm hearing is, whoever has demand, partners will find me. So should I create? So many of my yeah. clients, like, and maybe you watching, um, there was a time back in the early 2000s, and then certainly through eight, nine, 10, 11, mm -hmm. whether, you, whether you were 
had access to REO properties or you just were finding REO properties and literally people would do the deal of the week. Correct. And, and what was really fun for the person watching right now, consider this, um, if there was an imaginary group of eight of us inside the office and once a week, the story is we would get together, we'd all open up our laptops, we would go through the MLS and we would sort of battle out what we thought was the one property that we felt was a deal. And then the eight of us were just gonna notify every single person of our database of this property, why it was a deal, what it was about, why we felt it was that way. And, and many that did that, and I watched entire companies, yeah. enterprise mm -hmm. relationships, take that on as once a month, here's that they became known as a deal flow channel. Yeah, we'll take it yeah. one step further. And so so then you write the offers. So then what you do is you, you know, Kirk Kessel says, okay, I'm gonna make an offer on your property and I send out 10 offers a week. Then I get the deal that I want and then I go find the investors. And so then you post it with your 1,000, 5,000, 20,000 people in your- 20. In your, in, yeah, whatever it is, yeah. doesn't matter. Yes. You post it on your, on your uh, you know, as, as an email and say, hey, I've got this property. Here's the information. If you're interested, call me the phone will ring off the hook, right? Yeah. Ring off the hook. It, Tom, that's a good point. Cause one thing that I used to do is uh, quite a bit, it's, you know, early on in my career is I would find a deal like that. And then I would just, I would just send it out. I would yeah. blast it out right. to, right. you know, 30 different people and, yeah. and, you know, keep doing that and you identify uh, who are potential who's partners. Yeah. Right. Who's, who's, yeah. Yeah. Who's some of that. Yeah. Um, but so, so I think this is like a good place to get started. But I, I, I think some of the things, there's probably some people listening to that maybe already have one, two or three properties and it's yeah. like, okay, how to level up, yes. what, what okay. to do. I want to go there, but first you do educational events. Yeah. And that's another way. So will you just take a minute before we go to the level up group? Cause, cause part yeah. of that's that event strategy is obviously leveling up as well. Yeah. But just unpack high level. What do you do? How often, how many people show up? What's the impact? Yeah. Uh, so we do probably about every other month, uh, we'll probably get 50 to 60 people. We've had as much as 200 people show up, mm -hmm. uh, and it's real estate That's investing, great. uh, topics. So it's, it's education. And so because we done in the office done in the office, yeah. yep. Yep. And so, uh, because it's uh, a different speaker every single month, it's fresh, it's new, it's, it's something that they haven't heard. And it's, it's all focused on giving. It's like, what do, what do people need to hear right now? What will be helpful? What will cause them to bring a friend back, uh, mm -hmm. next, you yeah. know, next month or the next one. Is it, is it scary to, um, do your first event like that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You should get some accountability, like some yeah. people that just schedule the event, yes. some people that market yes. it and get some, some of that help. So you just book the date and then you have a few people, uh, help you with, with coordinating yeah. things. Yeah, so logistics. it's just done. And yeah. I think my first one, like my very first event, I think I had two people show up. Perfect. And yeah. we held the event and, and it was, it was great. And, but you know, so it, it doesn't always start like something big. You Everything know? Yeah. starts yeah. messy. And then you, so here's the thing for the person listening, um, who's a tax person in town, who's a real estate attorney in town, a CPA in town, who's a 1031 exchange expert, who's someone that owns apartment buildings, who's someone that owns multifamily. If you just go out to your network, mm -hmm. you know, five, six, seven people, maybe they're not a professional speaker, but she knows how to do 1031 exchange and she can come up and she can deliver that message. And for a segment of the market, you're speaking to exactly what they want to know. And I don't care if it's five people in the room, 50 people in the room, 500 people in the room. My old client, mm -hmm. Christina Martinez, mm -hmm. would put 2,500 people in a room. Wow. Now it started out with like wow. eight <laughs> at her office. Mm -hmm. And the last one that I went to was 2,500 people. And it was a real estate revival. She was doing panels of, okay, so I'm gonna bring up Martha. Martha is a single mom. She has four kids. She's a nurse. Martha, how many properties do you own? I now own 15. Right, like so, these are people that she had helped over mm -hmm. time, yeah. and literally, people were going to the back of the room and signing up to schedule an appointment to meet with one of her team. Schedule. So you could you could go that extreme, yeah. right? And this is a woman that, it, you know, this is the woman that bought the land next to her church, I remember that. Donated, donated all the money, yeah. right? Built for the children of San Jose. Shout out to Christina Martinez. Built this and donated the entire thing. So like. This wasn't, this wasn't one of those like TV things like, Hey, we're in your marketplace and you should come. <laughs> she was just the real thing. Just trying to help is kind of the way yeah. I see your heart. I see the same thing. And I know you resonate the same exact way. So, all right. So seminars, 
So let so, me just interrupt. So the only yes. thing that we add to what you do is yep. we do bring three different properties. So I might bring like a, uh, a big partnership where you put a syndication together. I might bring, bring an entitlement and then I might bring a single family or a duplex or a triplex. So I hit all three in the audience. We typically get only 40 to 60 people. They tend to be a lot of the same people and they were starting to bring more and more yep. of their friends. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they'll call you and say, hey, when is that next event? I want to schedule it right. because we bring them three properties. And then what afterwards they'll come back and say, hey, we'd like the syndication because we really don't want to mess with any of that stuff. So, you know, can you can you put us up down for that? And then we, then we schedule another time right. to meet with them to go over that stuff. Right. Yeah. So that's all. So I hope for the person listening, you haven't like mentally checked out with the thought that Oh my goodness, I'm going to be in front of seven people, 80 people, and I've got to become a professional. No, you, no. you are a trained real estate professional. You're talking yeah. about- You're a facilitator. Thank you. Yeah. Speak to that. Yeah. So you don't have to have the content. You just have to have some questions to right. pull it out of someone in your network. Mm -hmm. That right. That's that's right. all it is. You right. know, For me, what I would do is I would have a speaker come in about four times, and then on the maybe the fourth or the fifth time, I would be the speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of like Gary Vaynerchuk, give, right. give, give. You know, and you make and an ask. ask. Yes. Yeah. And and on that like fourth or fifth event, um, there would be a you know, a lot of people that you know, coffee meetings for the next two weeks totally booked, you yeah. know, with me and yeah. a lot of people from from the team. So you can do that, yes. or you could just continually give. And the more you give, the more the more you're going to attract. Yeah. So, so there is an important distinction if you're thinking about doing an event like this. It is not a sales pitch. It is no. a give, give, it's give, 100%. give, 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 give. And those that are interested are going to come to you and say, can I schedule a meeting? I'd like to learn more. All right, let's transition. Let's talk to the person that has three or four properties. They are, I don't want to say a control freak, but like that, you know, that like I'm going to control my own empire. Mm -hmm. how, does that, uh, how does that individual or family scale up? Where do they where do they go from three doors, four doors, five doors to 10, 50, 100? Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. So there's there's a couple of things that I like one concept that I think people should start thinking about more in real estate. And that's like payback time. So, you know, when they're investing and they're buying something, how quick can they get their investment back out of the property. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it's through a, maybe it's a, a refinance, you, you raise the rents, you refinance it so yeah. it's more valuable, you pull your money back out and then you know rinse and repeat. Uh, and so as you're, as you're scaling, I think that concept becomes uh, much more important because that's, that's how you grow uh, a lot faster. And you know there's, there's two ways to do that. One, the first way, like I said, raise the rents, pull the money back out, or kind of like what Kurt was talking about with creative financing. Can you mm -hmm. lower your down payment? Can you get into properties for less? Because yeah. if you can get in for less, your payback time on your investment is is less because it's it's that much, that smaller. And so, you know, it, it's all about recycling cash uh, and reusing that as fast as you can and, and finding markets that are, are growing faster. And that doesn't mean necessarily investing in other parts of the country, but take a look at your local market. There yeah. are sub markets that just grow a lot faster than yeah. others. Yep. And there are, are certain classes of properties and ages of properties that grow faster than others. Okay, let's stop there for a second. I know you have more insight on this. I do. I'm like, how <laughs> should, how should, so, so this savvy person watching right now is now saying, how do I look at my MLS to figure that out? Like I know if I'm sitting in Dallas, the smart money, the smartest people I know right now in Dallas, I mean, the smartest and the wealthiest people I know are buying as much of South Dallas as they can get their hands on. Because mm -hmm. North Dallas is now Oklahoma. Yeah. West is only gonna go so far, right? Before we're in just a oil wells, right? East, you only got a two hour drive and then you're in Louisiana. And I've already driven that route and I've seen the expansion east. So north is covered, west is, I would say there's there's expansion opportunity, but South Dallas, South Dallas is the 20 year play. Now I'm not asking you to go look at South Dallas mm -hmm. and I'm letting you know that <laughs> multiple billionaires that I know are trying to buy up all of South Dallas. Now, what oh. insights did they have? What are they looking at? I don't think the, I don't think any one of these families are just geniuses and you're looking at some data. So what data should we be looking at? Yeah. So I, I pay attention to where is the population moving? Uh, right now, there's there's some trends that came out. I think Florida was actually number one. Texas was number two, and it's all <laughs> it's 
it, it, it it's all in the major metros in Texas. Yeah. So yeah. so and why is that important? Because if if people are moving in there, construction cannot keep up. And if construction yeah. cannot yeah. keep up, yeah. uh, what's going to happen? Demand, it's demand, supply demand. and demand, yeah. and rents are going to go up. And if rents are going up, then the value of your building is going up. And the faster your building is going up. The, the faster you're de-risking yourself. Mm -hmm. So you're putting money in and your risk is going away like that because your mm -hmm. building is shooting up in price. Right. So where the population is moving um, is important. Because so Census that, Bureau data, is it trucking data? Is it yeah. reading USA Today that says the top 25, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah, where, it's, where do it's, they go? No, yeah, it's not I watching you know your the market. news. No, no. I, okay, so everyone says they know their market. And then I say, so where are you buying? And they're like, well, I don't know, I'm still, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know my market. I'm not, I'm not, because I'm not I'm razzing at, the person that right. might be that, but help them. You got to look at the areas like, like we look at areas that are uh, short of supply and demand. So mm -hmm. like we have a beach side, we call it beach side, but you know, once you go over the causeway, it's everything on the beach side. They're not making that anymore. No. So if you can buy something and most of those houses that are over there are 40, 50, 60 years old. So they're a challenge. They need to be redone. But like, to Eric's point, if you can buy those properties, you can fix them up. You can usually get a, a really good value, especially on the ones that need a lot of fix up. If you've if you've got a handyman or you're handy, you can fix them up. If you get owner financing, you can sometimes get the owners to defer the payments for six months. You know, we just did a commercial property. We deferred the payments for a year. We didn't add it to the back end or anything. We just deferred the payments for a year. In the meantime, we're collecting rents on part of the property. And then you go in and fix the property up. And that's the whole reason we got those payments deferred. What, what Eric didn't mention is when you refinance those properties, that money's tax deferred. Right. So if you go, you buy a $100,000 property and in five years it's worth two hundred, and you decide, hey, I've only got a $50,000 mortgage and I'm going to pull out only 50%. That was always my rule. I never pulled out more than 50%, but you could probably pull out 70% on a refi. That, that money's tax deferred until you sell it. If you don't sell it in this lifetime, you get an adjusted basis. I mean, you talk to your tax person, but it's, it's pretty attractive. It's pretty attractive to be able yeah. to do that. Right. So let, let's talk about. Do we answer your, we really didn't answer your question about, about how you pick the area because well, you said look for areas. So if I'm looking inside my MLS, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, okay, so where do homes come on the market? Very rarely. Mm -hmm. And when they do, they sell with multiple offers. Yeah. The that, other that's the other thing you're looking for a is a cash way. flow too. You're going to have to look at the cash flow because in a perfect world, it may not be the perfect area, but it's got a great cash flow. Yep. And Or you look at an area that's been really beat up hard mm -hmm. that you think like our downtown area hasn't really had a, a facelift in 40 years. It's now got yep. new hotels, new yep. new shopping centers going in. Seeing Anything in our little downtown area is, is a buy now. I mean, yep. you could have bought, when I started buying, they were in the 20s and $30,000. That's what you paid for a house. Today, those same little houses are worth three hundred and fifty, And they're, they're 1940s, 50s, 60s. I mean, you could tear them down if you want, but I mean, they are in the heart of the They're downtown. Vintage. They're, They're vintage. vintage. Yeah, well, so <laughs> hey, that, wait right? to get the insurance <laughs> yes. on it. You'll be scared to death. That's the other yes. thing. So there's a lot of different, yeah, a lot of different yeah. key, key I mean, things I, to look I, at. insights on just knowing your local market. Yeah. So a lot of times, what I've seen, and and in my local market, there's there's an investor. We had a great conversation about this. Sometimes there's like what's called a glitch in the. He calls it a glitch the in matrix. the matrix, exactly. right? Uh, where it's, a, we call it glitch in the market, where there is a, uh, a price difference uh, between uh, two markets where uh, it, it seems like the value to get, you know, to buy a house, one of the cheaper houses, and to put the money in to get it up to this value mm -hmm. is significantly more than what it would be just to buy that house, you know, that that's kind of yeah. already done, mm -hmm. you know? And so if you have a lot of people that are shopping for these lower end, properties and they need to put money and they're going to fix them up. Uh, and you know that when they put the money in, their value is going to be here. Mm -hmm. Just skip these lower end ones, buy something that's a little bit nicer, that's already done. Yep. And you're going to see your value shoot right up without doing anything to it. Yeah. You know, in the span of like a year, or a couple Both of years. Work. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what's so much fun about real estate is it just, A, it's a forever game and you can just, there's just opportunities in pockets everywhere. Mm -hmm. How much time do you guys spend today? And then I'm going to transition to something entirely different. How much time do you guys spend today just looking for opportunities? Uh, so it's myself and there's probably two other guys that, that are uh, shopping around. And so between the three of us, um, I mean, it's, it's a couple hours a week. It's not like substantial, but we also uh, we spend a lot of time developing relationships with brokers who are 
passing along family stuff. Yep, who are passing stuff. along opportunities. So it's not just us, but you know, our outreach and being very specific of what we're looking for. Yep. Um, so even though maybe it doesn't sound like a ton of time us just hunting around, mm -hmm. um, we've built a system to help us channel and, and find opportunities. And, and so, I spend more go. time. Yep. Yeah, I spend I spend any minimum an hour to two hours a day. I just got four properties sent to me since we got in your room here. So mm -hmm. I got four properties to look at. They're all big, you know, in, industrial type properties. So they take some time to look at, but I'll look at them. If they pass my muster, I'll pass them to another guy on the team and say, hey, dig this apart, look at the numbers, see what I'm missing, but I, I like it. Usually it's, I like the location. Sometimes I like the numbers better than I like the location. So if the numbers are really good, it might get, might get my attention. Um, you know, out of the four I looked at today, I like a one a lot, which was the, and they're brokers that are all sending this stuff to me. So I've, I've developed a relationship that they are like, hey, I don't want the commission. You send me the deal, I'll buy the deal, you'll represent me and you'll represent the seller on this yeah. deal, you'll be a transaction broker and I'll buy the property. But I'm looking, I'm looking for great properties. Um, they all know what I'm looking for. Uh, and if I don't buy them, then I then I sell them to one of my investors. So there I mean, the reality is, if the number's pretty good, I probably won't buy it. If the money's number's really good, then I will buy it. Um, but uh, my investors, they're happy with an eight or ten percent return. So I think the message for the listener is that you know you guys are actively spending time in mm -hmm. the market, talking to mm -hmm. people, looking at deals. What I would advise you to consider is this: go into your MLS. Let's just say you're in the U.S. and you have uh, access to like a Remine, R-E-M-I-N-E, -E, and you literally say, um, give me every uh, every person in my area that owns more than five doors under an LLC or a personal name, and now all of a sudden, Remine's gonna say, here they are, Yeah, right? They take your entire geography and they say, here they are. And, and what if you just said, I'm gonna take this pocket community, that pocket community, this pocket community, because what do we know? We know somewhere in the range of about 22 million properties are owned by investors today in the US of the 100 and now 38 mm -hmm. million properties, or I think it's now 139 million. So so 22 million properties are owned by. We know that 20% are owned by Blackstone and all the you know the big monster the big you know, funds out. that went up, but 80% of them are mom and pops that own 10 or 10 mm -hmm. or less doors. And I would argue for what better demographic farming for Can you? Can I tell you what to say when you call? Please. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Don't tell us. Let's not have that on the show, Eric. Let's say yes. Please. So I I'll I'll sit down and do this every once in a while with you know people on my team and and call. And just last week I uh called a guy. And so many times we call and we say, Hey, you know, we're looking to to buy a place or yep. we're an agent that's you know looking for sellers and we're representing <clears throat> the buyer. Yes. Yada, yada, yeah, yada. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, if you own one property, uh, I will challenge you, you are always a seller. At a certain price, you are a seller. 100%. So why not approach the conversation as, hey, I'm I'm a real estate agent, but I'm also a seller in your area. And uh, you know, before I take my property to the market, you know, or whatever you're going to eventually do with that property, are are you a buyer? Mm -hmm. You know, flip the script and ask them if they're looking to add to their portfolio. You know, give them a compliment of I'm not looking to just sell to anyone. I'm looking to sell to someone who's qualified who has identified themselves in the past of, of owning investment property in this area. Um, it just takes their guard down, opens up a different conversation. Mm -hmm. And most of the time what ends up happening is, no, I'm not a buyer, but actually I'm probably going to be a seller pretty mm -hmm. soon. Yeah, right. They switch yeah. on you. Right. Yeah. Don't right. just switch your hat right away and right. jump in and be like, right. okay, let Don't me help you. Don't kill. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask for sex immediately. <laughs> yeah. Right? This is the mistake that so many people made. Like, yeah. actually but have a conversation. It allows you thoughtful. to build a relationship. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And understand, you know, where they are and ask yeah. them if they're going to do a 1031 to try to understand some motivations and timeline right. and, right. and throw out some questions like that. And it just opens up the door. Uh, and don't you think it's different to calling <clears throat> as an investor? Yes. Right. Just totally. One different. investor to another. Yes, I'm a licensed real estate professional at Banana. Um, I'm just calling yes. about, right? And would you yep. be interested? And I see, I notice you own a collection of properties. I love that. Yeah. And, and so, are you finding out um, that when you call these people, a lot of them are aging out and they're saying, we're selling course. because we just, we don't want to manage this property anymore. Yeah. They course. own it free and clear. And so, would you consider holding a mortgage rather than just putting the money in the bank and getting no yep. percent yeah. interest? Yep. And I would tell you that. Last week, yes. there's a, a guy Tell I spoke to. He's like, you know, I'm in my late seventies, and not only am I going to sell that property that you know that you mentioned that I own in the area, but I got three others. Yeah. 
And uh, I, I got to figure out a plan of what to do with them pretty soon. Yeah, so like, if you can show them how they can get the income mm -hmm. that comes in every single month, now all right. of a sudden you got owner financing with no bank involved. And yep. then you can structure that any want. You can structure it at low interest rate. As it goes up, you can structure it straight amortization. You can straight do it with a balloon. It, 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 the sky's his, the limit. This is his happy place. <laughs> this is my happy <laughs> place. Yeah, like all he wants to do. It's like, yeah, that's all I want to do. Can we slow him down like, a little bit? I want to go on get so three excited, to five yeah. $8 listing appointments and I want to do this all day long. Well, I get so excited because they all they do is say, hey, you know, like, like you said, yeah, we're aging out. We think we want to sell. Hey, would you want to hold some financing? No, 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 no. Yeah. Then by the time you're done talking to them, the advantage of holding financing, they're like, yeah, I'd love to hold it. Yeah, that's a great idea. Right. You mean yeah. I don't have to pay all the capital? Yeah, you just explained the advantages. And it's an advantages. arbitrage, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an arbitrage. You, you're, yeah. Hey, you're you're collecting the rent now. You're making the payment. You're making the difference. Now you're going to get a payment every month. And uh, guess what? It doesn't matter much. when the toilet backs up. It doesn't right. matter if yeah. you have a tenant problem. Yeah. The check's coming. Right. So, okay, so let's play a game. Um, so let's just say I bought a 10 plex and just for fun, the 10 plex is a bunch of two bedroom, two bath with backyards surrounded by high rises, by the way. Cool. So, so yep. I guess it's, it's, it's actually a real life example. I know the do, example. do you own this property? <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> but, I, but I said 10, it's, it's a nine plex. Okay. Um, they're just to give you context, they're popcorn ceilings. Yeah. Carpet. Mm hmm. You guys with me on yeah, this? Sure. But they have a backyard and 87% of the people that live in this community own a dog. Mm -hmm. So big advantage to the little backyards. Yeah. Right, Courtney? Yes, right? Dogs, cats, lizards, everything else lives <laughs> in your house. Um, Miles. So so as people are, how do, how do I make that property better? How do I how do I amplify the value of that property? Yeah. Popcorn ceilings, carpet, built in like the mid 80s in a beautiful part of town. I mean, a mega hotel I've going next to it. I've you know that you know that. You know. Know so so, so I'm, I'm giving this as an example because I want the person to hear yeah. how your mind works in terms of what we're going to do with this property to improve the value. Yeah. So I, this is frustrating, but I'll answer your question with the question: uh, What are the things that tenants would pay more for? You know, what would they? agree to pay more in rent. Like, yes, I would love to pay more in rent if you do this to my property, you know? And you think about some of the, yep. maybe the others around. So you mentioned like the popcorn ceiling, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they don't know that they would pay more, no. but maybe, um, you know, maybe some of those little aesthetic touches do go a long way. Maybe like there's some, some new vinyl floor. Yeah. Maybe something that like that. Like some, mm -hmm. some backsplash. backsplash. Yeah. And, yeah, a, and new, it's, a new little countertop because the kitchen's going to be small. Right. Mm -hmm. those, maybe a couple of new appliances. And, just, and, just to so here's what stoves, you do. New stoves, mm -hmm. old oven, new oven. Mm -hmm. That sounds expensive. And you can get them. No, because you, you take, can go to Facebook marketplace and get this stuff a lot of times and redo these units pretty inexpensively. Yeah. So you take one unit, mm -hmm. you make it really nice. Mm -hmm. you, you just do stainless steel, granite, marble, yeah. All, yeah. all these things. Uh, you raise the rent. Uh, and then when you raise the rent, you go back to all your other tenants when their leases come up and you basically say, look, this is market rate for a, a nice unit. Uh, would you uh, would you let us renovate and we can we can put you in there or better yet, uh, we won't do this, but we know that market is here. We'll cut you a deal and will raise your rent a little bit, yep. but mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it's not up here. Exactly. And so they feel like, you know, they're getting I'm a getting deal because they're getting, yeah. And yeah. a slight improvement, a slight in <clears throat> increase versus a bigger increase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like what, what we do and, and Tom on a lot of video, I'm thinking yeah. about the video. So like on a lot of our investors, this is, mm -hmm. yes. yeah, there's some simple things that you can do in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. So like appliances that does not, that's not a major renovation. Yep. You know, putting in a backsplash is half a day's worth of work. Yep. Putting in a counter, they just swap that out the same day. Yep. So you start doing just some things like that and maybe some lighting, which are just swapped out mm -hmm. it's not a major inconvenience to their life to do some of these upgrades yeah. but you know in our apartment buildings we'll do these We're things this like 191 units yeah. down wow. in houston and we'll we'll do this for another. under two grand a unit swap out the lights the counters backsplash appliances uh and uh well not the appliances but i, all say, the well, gonna, yeah. I need to get yeah, your yeah. contact yeah yeah <laughs> exactly not, not the appliances <laughs> yeah the appliances are an extra yeah. uh 1500 yeah. but we'll we'll do counters and and backsplash mm -hmm. and lighting and and uh we'll increase the rent by about 2800 a year and, and that's, what's the what's the increase of the value of the property on so think 191 oh. units 
yeah. do that over a couple of years. And this, this is, so yeah, yeah, when I was talking about payback time in real estate, if, if something pays itself back in under 15 years, that's a good deal. When you mm -hmm. consider leverage, like you do that deal. Now we talked about, this is a $2,000 investment. It gets you 2,800. The payback time is like nine, 10 months. Yep. So yeah. not only is that a good deal, that's an incredible deal. So right. if we talk about the, what it adds to the P and L. So what this does to the property, uh, it actually with like a, we talk in terms of cap rate in commercial yeah. real mm -hmm. estate. So in this market, it's about a five and a half percent cap rate. Mm -hmm. So you, you multiply that out and it's about $50,000 of value to the building just by adding two grand of investment. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's not time. Yes. That's not like, units, times if you do that units, deal, it's how many units. times can you do that deal? Right. You know, right. Invest a dollar, get twenty five back. Yeah. Well, and the and, long play on something like that is if if it's in like like where your nine units are in just a, an excellent area, you would just keep fixing them up, and every yeah. ten years you pull money out and go buy more, and yet every ten years you pull money out and go buy more. So the reality is, you're taking that money that that the tenants have put in there, you're refinancing it sixty percent, fifty percent, whatever whatever you want, pulling the money out and putting it in something else, and yeah. you continue to leverage yourself and buy. So I bring this up not as an yeah. example of what Kath and I are what we're yeah. doing, but it's so often I see when, when I walk through units, I look and I'm just like, why did the owner not ever fix this thing up? And I think for the like the phone calls you're making, when you're going into those properties, you need to be I would imagine as I walk in, I think to myself, two, three, four, five grand I'm going to improve the rents. I'm going to improve the quality of the experience of the tenant. Yeah. I'm going to make, you know, low flow. You're going to have like all the, all the things you can do. And all of a sudden now it's a, it's a better property. It's a green property. Like, mm -hmm. like I'm going to, but, but a lot of people, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe just some of the properties I'm going to say, I'm just not seeing that. Yeah. yeah but like, like Eric said, if you tell them, Hey, we, if you, if you want, we'll totally renovate the property or we'll just do a little renovation. Right. If you do a little renovation and you charge them a fair, a fair bump in the yeah. rent, yeah. they'll stay in there. So they're paying you the rent the whole time, which is wonderful because mm -hmm. the unit's not empty for 30 days. So you'll redo the kitchen while right. they're in there. Very inconvenience for a week, big deal, right. maybe a couple of days. Right. But all of a sudden your rent just bumped up by five, 10, 15, 20% because right. you did a little bit of a facelift to it. Yeah. Why people don't do that, Tom? I don't know. Doesn't uh, make sense. You know, they, they just, they get intimidated. They yeah. get advice from the wrong people. You know, they get advice from the contractor who's saying, you know, let's let's replace the block walls in the basement, you know, instead mm -hmm. of, yeah. right? Like they just don't know what really adds value. They don't think yeah. like an investor needs yep. to think. What will tenants pay more for? So a lot of times it's some of those little cosmetics, but then there are people that get too tripped up on like just the interior stuff uh, and they forget to take a step back and they're like, okay, does the exterior, you know, you also have to have a right. nice enough exterior right. where it's all consistent and it tells the same story. So don't mm -hmm. just do those things. Right. If on the outside, it looks like a pig. So they drive by and they keep driving by. <laughs> <Right>. Well, I <laughs> yeah. mean, I mean, I don't know, not, not in every situation, but getting rid of grass and doing pebbles. And like, there's just yeah. so many, all the, just some of those things that just modernize the property mm -hmm. or yep. uh, again, we can talk for days on this. Let, <laughs> let's just, let's end with biggest mistakes to avoid. Over leverage. hundred yeah. percent. Over leverage. Would so be what's the, the so what's the right amount of money down on a deal today? Um, deal is just not a, not a, like I got a bargain. It's just a it, transaction. It just depends. If you're buying a house, one house or two houses, it, it's 20%. If you're buying multiple units, you know, you're buying 191 units. You want to make sure that if the market takes a little bit of dump, you have COVID and they don't have to pay their rent, that you can pay the rents, that you can pay the mortgages. Yeah. So um, most of the stuff I buy, my goal is to get it, keep it at 50% loan to value. Mm -hmm. Um, and when it gets 50%, then I refinance it usually to 75, 80%. And then like all my shopping centers, they pay off in seven or 10 years. I just refinance them. My goal is to now buy properties with two options. One, you either buy it to sell it, flip it. It's a flip within yep. 24 months. Yep. Or the other one is to hold it until death do us part. Yep. Yep. And I just keep refinancing and just, but they're all in great areas. The areas are the key if you're so, going to keep them. So 20 plus percent down. Ease, absolutely. Yeah. Minimum. Don't, don't do, Minimum. don't do less. I mean, cause you could get hundred percent financing. I, I've done that a lot, uh, but it'll clobber you if the market changes, it'll clobber yeah. you. Yeah. I like that man. Safe. What do you mm -hmm. think? Yeah. More? Yeah. Same? I, 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 uh, I absolutely agree with you. I'd, I'd have some points that I would say to that, but just to, 
contrast things or give a different perspective. Uh, if you're looking at investing with someone or like maybe a syndication or something, you know, you, you first look at the the person, the group that's sponsoring it. Yep, yep. Um, then you're going to look at generally, I would say the area, and then you're going to look at the building. Sure. And, and so, you know, if you're investing with someone, um, invest with, with someone that 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 has more than you do you know that that has more resources that has more experience that you can learn from that you can level up uh you know so don't don't just go and invest with someone that maybe just just has money but they they can't really contribute anything else you know so if you're if you're getting started like be thoughtful about who you're partnering with so you can grow faster so then to our relationship yeah Yeah, for sure and then you know the, the the second mistake is yeah don't buy in an area where people are moving out of. Uh, you know, I've lost big investing in a few cities that are declining in population. Yep. Uh, and I'll never do that again. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, yeah, and, be, and to your point, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. For I mean, sure. I, I've seen it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, make sure that the people you're, the group you're investing, you know, the partners, you know, the people that are running it. Um, and you're comfortable. I, I can't tell you the deals that have been brought to me that they sound, Oh my gosh, I, I got to do this deal. And they all belly up. Yeah. 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 Well, we were chatting earlier in the green room, like, oh, it's an unbelievable deal. Well, would you put money in it? The guy's like, why? Well, uh, uh, how, how unbelievable is a deal? Exactly. If you're not, you're not put putting money your money in into it. it. Right. Yeah. But if they go, yeah, of course I would partner with you on this. Then you're like, okay, cool. You're like putting your money where putting your mouth is. Yeah. I really appreciate like, he has been not like, well, like one of my closest friends for a long time, but he's been like a mentor and I've watched him call the ham thing about this deal. What do you think? And you know, you're now in that same category for me of like, man, we're doing these big monster deals. Like, what are you doing? What's behind the scenes? Help me understand. Like, I, I think we just got to be in that growth mindset, not in that. Well, I, I was burned once I was bit by a dog once, or I'm afraid, but instead like lean into others. Mm-hmm. Like that's, I mean, this is probably the most relaxed podcast I've ever done, <laughs> but it's also one of the ones that like, I wish I, like I typically am taking notes. Right, because you he talks a mile a minute and has like a wealth of knowledge. You got the same. You talk a little slower. Thank you. Um, so I hope for the person I get listening. Excited. Yeah, you well, but and you have a lot to contribute. Um, and he didn't, by the way, share where he makes his real money. But I'm going to save that for another podcast. So as we wrap, if they if they want to ask you guys questions, can they reach out to you? Absolutely. Where do they Where do they find you? Slowly. Um, which website? Probably. I don't know how <laughs> they reach out. To just you. just text me. The best way is to text me three two one five four four. Nine nine nine, nine, nine three. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yes. send me a text yes. and I will respond. Yeah, Kirk Kessel. All right. Yeah. Um, you had a question? It, probably on Instagram. It's just yeah. at Eric Eikoff. Yep. Uh, Spell it. Uh, so it's just my first name E R I C and then last name E I C K H O F. Um, there wasn't was pretty an, fast. There was an yes, impersonator was account. I know. I saw that. <laughs> you know? I said, yes. Uh, uh, just last week. Like, try and kill him. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, it has a, a period between the Eric and the Icop. So don't follow that one. Yes. Uh, do not follow that. One. <laughs> it has yes. good advice because it's copied all of my stuff, but it's it's not me. So I, we need to kill I them. do not support cryptocurrency investing. Yeah. Oh, no, I, it's not that yes. I don't support it. It's just that I don't know you're, anything you're about currently. Yeah. Don't do. Yeah. Like, hey, Tom Ferry's trying to sell me cryptocurrency. No, he's not. Under any circumstances. Okay, yeah. so thank you guys. Um, and I'm sure you know a lot of uh, people are going to reach out. This was mm-hmm. very valuable. I mean, we kind of went low to advanced, right? So thank you guys. We should talk to him about off camera where he makes his real money, but I'm going to save that for another show. So share this with a friend or two that might need to get this message. Share it with a friend. You know what you should do? Share with a, a 19 year old and a 15 year old. Because hearing those two stories, I bought my first property at 19. So I'm, I'm kind of in that same vein, but you guys like job, yeah. clobbered me with how much you guys are doing. I'm just so impressed Not by both of you, um, maybe sharing it with them and having them just spark a little imagination of what's possible, right? Like okay. real estate's pretty rad, it right? Is. And if a young person gets it and a mature person gets it and an old person gets it and an older person gets it, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> who knows what's possible. Exactly. All right. So thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for watching this and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next show. Take care.